Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we're going to be talking about warfarin. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment down below. Don't forget to subscribe and check out ninjanerd.org where we have all of our notes and illustrations for these videos. So, warfarin. As we talk about warfarin, it's also commonly referred to as Coumadin, and this is one of our top 100 meds or those medications that your patients may be on most of the time or a 100 med that you're going to find often. And for the NCLEX, when we talk about warfarin, we're talking about specifically a medication in the class of an anticoagulant. So an anticoagulant, and specifically with warfarin, we're going to be talking about its mechanism of action and how this works in the body. So let's recall quickly the cat clotting cascade and how that works within our body. So we have all these different clotting factors here, and we want to remember that there's an extrinsic and an intrinsic pathway that we can go through. And we have 12, that goes to 11, that goes to 9, plus 8, goes to 10. That's our extrinsic and then our intrinsic. Sorry, no, that's our intrinsic and then our extrinsic goes 3 to 7 to 10, right? 10 plus 5 then goes to 2, goes to 1, and then we have fibrin. And normally when our body clots, this is, what, this is what's occurring. Now there's a whole bunch of other stuff we can go into with the clotting cascade. It's just to recall that we have all these different clotting factors with all these different numbers, and as they work through this cascade, we eventually have a clot that forms. But within warfarin, what happens is we have a couple different inactivations or not properly functioning clotting factors. And those are 7, 10, 9, and 2. So 10, 9, 7, and 2 are the clotting factors that are typically inhibited or have an issue of working properly when we do take warfarin. So you want to think back to what's going on with warfarin and how our body goes through to metabolize it. We take warfarin within our body, goes through the liver, and when it gets to the liver, there is a whole bunch of actions that occur. Vitamin K can be reduced. And basically what is happening is warfarin inhibits vitamin K on the most basic level, it inhibits vitamin K. From there, vitamin K then cannot properly allow these clotting factors to function properly, and therefore we have a decrease in clot formation, meaning a decrease in the production of fibrin. So that's great. When we take warfarin, the overall is the decrease in clot formation, right? And that's how we know that this is an anticoagulant. But we want to start thinking when we have a decrease in clot formation, what is the subsequent issue that can occur with our patient? If we have a decrease in clot formation, we can have an increase in bleeding, right? And that's where our concern comes in with this patient, because if our patient does have a problem with clotting and therefore it can bleed out, we need to think about what are the ways that we can keep our patient safe. So on the NCLEX, the big things are we're going to hit on how do we keep our patients safe and how do we know that their blood is thinning or not coagulating at the right pace. So let's look here at the NCLEX little tip sheet here that I drew out. The biggest thing for the NCLEX to first hit is the antidote. And it's going to ask you what is the antidote for warfarin or a patient's experiencing bleeding, they're on warfarin, what are you going to do? And the antidote is within our mechanism of action. Our antidote is vitamin K. And if you think about it, if we have a lot of warfarin within our blood, right? So we have all this blood, right? And then our patient maybe takes the blue warfarin, because if the more you know about warfarin is there's a bunch of different doses and they all have different colors, it's all standardized. So we have warfarin in our blood and we have our blood right here. And it's preventing from clots forming because we're inhibiting vitamin K. So what we need to do is overload and give vitamin K to allow that process to occur so that therefore we can increase back in our clot formation. So you're going to think, well, how do I know if I've given them too much Coumadin or not enough Coumadin, too much Warfarin, not enough? How, how do I know? How do we know? How do we know which one's good? Because it can go from anywhere from one milligram up to 10. How do I know which one's working great for our patient? Well, there's lab values that we specifically hit on to measure that. And the one that the NCLEX likes to hit on more commonly is the INR. The lab value that we're going to be looking at is a therapeutic range of 2 to 3. And what that means is that we're able to measure where our warfarin levels are within our body. Now there also is a different level that we can have as well, and that's a patient that may have a prosthetic valve put in. Their INR 
typically is a little higher of 2.5 to 3.5. And that has to do with them having a prosthetic valve that is hopefully not being attacked by our own body. So because the body recognizes that as a foreign invader, it's gonna start attacking it as a foreign invader, even though it's something that we beneficially need. So we need to you know, kind of trick the blood into thinking, hey, this is actually okay. We don't wanna be causing clots right on that valve. So we wanna make sure that this is doing what it needs to do. So an INR value of a little higher for somebody who has a prosthetic valve. But overall, the NCLEX likes to always ask about the INR because that is something that we can measure and it's uh, substantially usually the same for every patient. But let's go into indications. Why are we giving our patient a medication that is basically causing them to not clot and then therefore bleed? What is a patient issue or a patient problem that you can think of that would be something where we want them to not clot anymore, right? One of those would be the most common thing that we can talk about when we start learning in nursing school is a DVT, a thrombosis, right? So we don't want our patient having any type of thrombosis because what can happen with that, that DVT? That DVT can break off and it can go where? It can go to the brain and when our patient has a thrombus in the brain, they could have a stroke, okay? The thrombus could travel somewhere else into the heart, right? And they could have an MI. Patient could also have an, another issue completely different. They're not developing DVTs, but they are developing clots within, inside the heart, in the chambers, because of an irregular rhythm. And we know that as AFib, so they might be on an anticoagulant for that. And there also might be an issue with somebody who having a, has a clot in their lung, which we know is a pulmonary embolism, or PE. So patients typically get put on warfarin because they have some type of clotting problem, where they are actually clotting maybe too much, or they're clotting in places that we don't want them to. So we need to make sure that the, we reduce that clot formation. So what's going on with our patient? If they are taking this medication, what are signs and symptoms that we're gonna be looking for as adverse drug reactions or things that we don't want um, to occur, that maybe we're, we're making the blood work, uh, the clot formation uh, not causing, it's, it's too good, it's working too good. So what are the things we're gonna be looking at our patient? The first thing is any type of bleeding, right? Because we want our patient to be able to clot, but there's a line of like, now you're bleeding too much. So now we need to stop that. Um, so one of them is if they are brushing their teeth and they are seeing their bloody gums, like they have bleeding gums when they're brushing their teeth, that could be a sign that maybe the INR is approaching a level that maybe is too high for us. And then you wanna think other signs of bleeding. What are other signs of bleeding within our patient? If they have blood in their urine, right? So they have hematuria. They have it a, a positive blood occult, right, in their stool. What else could be occurring? They could be vomiting blood. They could have lots of bruising. Specifically, it's almost like non, it's not ending. It's just this huge bruise that's just all over the place. And then we also want to think of things that we can see. Maybe they're talking about some type of um, stomach pain or they're having like, some type of chest pain. Things that are giving us signs that maybe this patient is bleeding in areas that we don't quite see yet and we need to do some interventions. So when we talk to this patient and we teach them about their warfarin and when they're taking this medication along with them being in the hospital, we want to talk to them about the medication and how it works, teach them about it, tell them what's going on with it. So the first thing is this medication that they are taking is something that they need to take at the same time daily. Right, So they're taking warfarin and it needs to be taken at the same time daily. Why? We're trying to keep that INR at the same level, right? We don't want a really, really high high, a really low low. We don't want them bleeding a lot and then clotting a lot. So it needs to be a nice consistent delivery of this medication. And this also has to do with warfarin because warfarin actually takes a couple days for it to occur. So when we talk about taking warfarin, it goes through the body, it inhibits all of these clotting factors. That takes a couple of days, but it takes a couple of days because the body already has developed fibrin and other materials within the body to make clots. And it does not break down the current clots, it does not break down the current materials it has, but it prevents the body from making more. So those things in the body that have lifespans of over four days or three days take a long time for that number to come down. So as we start taking Coumadin, we don't usually see the effects of it to maybe over three to five days. Typically it's on the later end of five days. 
So when they do take it, what are we going to tell them to avoid? They need to avoid things that will potentially cause issues with this medication. So it may cause issues with bleeding. It may increase that INR. What's a medication that might do that? We want to look at things like aspirin or NSAIDs, right? We also want to look at things like alcohol. Why is alcohol something that we would want to look away from? Well, remember, where does it metastasize? It metastasizes and goes into the liver, and then we have this whole occurrence. So if we're causing issues or damage to our liver, we may also then cause issues with the absorbance and the workforce of our warfarin. What about our diet? Now, it's, the NCLEX is tricky, so you want to keep an eye on how it's always worded. The diet for the patient is always a consistent consistent green leafy vegetables, right? We want to look through for that green leafy vegetable, but it needs to be consistent. Things like spinach, things like broccoli. Why? These foods have vitamin K in them. Remember, these foods have vitamin K in them, okay? We're not talking about potassium, we're talking about vitamin K. So. They need to have a consistent delivery of vitamin K into their body. These green leafy vegetables need to be consistent. If they're somebody who eats three salads a week, eat three salads a week. But don't go and eat one salad one week and then next week have five because now we're changing that level of vitamin K and with that warfarin trying to work, it's going to be able to fluctuate. It can't. So then therefore we're going to have fluctuations in our clot formation. We also want to think about at home. When the patient is at home, we need to think about a couple things. The first is the toothbrush. It needs to be soft. The toothbrush needs to be soft. So that way we aren't causing any more damage to our gums, right? We don't want our gums bleeding. They also want to use an electric razor. Because remember this patient is going to be going to have problems clotting. So they don't want them to have open cuts everywhere and bleeding all over the place. And the last thing is you want to think of them as a fall or bleed risk. So what are some things is all going back to is safety. So how can they be safe? Well, if they have an issue with falling, you might want to say, you know, do they have a lot of steps? Are there lots of rugs all over floors that can slide places? And you want to just look out for that type of teaching because this patient now is taking an uh, anticoagulant. And when this patient falls, they have chance to bleed. So we don't want them hitting their head and having a and bleeding. They're going to monitor what? We're going to monitor that INR, right? They might have to go get some blood levels checked. They may be able to do it at home, which is great. And then we also want to talk to them about missing a dose. If they miss a dose and it's within the same day, the rule is typically the same day. So if they miss a dose Monday morning and it's, it's lunchtime and they're like, oh, I forgot to take my warfarin, they can take it really quickly and then, great, go to the next day, let your doctor know, hey, I missed it, but I took it, that's okay. But if they missed it and it's the next day and they're like, maybe I should just double down because I forgot to take Mondays, don't do that because now we're taking too much warfarin at once. So if they miss a dose, they can take it again or soon in the same day. And that's usually very easy for a patient to remember that they're saying, oh, I forgot to take Mondays, it's still Monday, I'll take it. But if it's the next day, then I'm just going to have to skip that dose. The last thing about the dosing as well is they want to make sure that their dentist and all their providers are aware in case they need to stop it before a procedure or take a smaller dose. So meaning that they are going in for a procedure or they need to go get dental work. They may have to you know, tell their provider and they may need to lower their dose or stop it for a couple days so that they're able to recover from that procedure. Last thing I want to touch on here is our contraindications. We want to make sure that when we are taking care of our patient or if they're coming in and we see an order, we're like, hmm, that seems odd. I don't think this is the right thing to be giving this patient. So what are some contraindications for this patient? Remember, what is the main organ that we're talking about when we talk about warfarin is the liver. So if they have any issues with the liver, you want to think maybe this patient shouldn't be on warfarin. Maybe there's another type of medication we should be giving them. 
Think about warfarin as a whole. What is the whole goal of warfarin? It's to decrease, decrease clot formation, therefore increase bleeding. So if a patient already has some type of bleeding issue, so you want to think about peptic ulcers that might be bleeding or any type of aneurysm or varices that may be a dual-edged sore that we don't want to give them too much because then if that does perforate and burst, then we're going to have some other bleeding issues as well. And the last is if the patient is pregnant. This can pass the placenta and cause some issues as well with these patients. So we want to keep that in mind when we are talking about warfarin. So that is it, Ninja Nerds. That is the video on Warfarin, the top 100 meds for the NCLEX. I hope it made sense, and as always, until next time.